All right, everyone. Welcome back to the land of Kev. I am your host and the author. My name is Jeffrey Drum. Thank you all so much for joining me again. All right, everyone, welcome back. This is episode 80, and today I will be discussing the configuration and function of the quote-unquote Grand Gallery Chamber, which I will henceforth be referring to as the contact process chamber of the Great Pyramid. A question was proposed in the comments section by IG199 as to why this chamber is constructed on a slant. So I figured I would dive into the multiple functions for the complex engineering behind this component. If this is the type of content you're interested in, please subscribe to The Land of Chem here on YouTube and click that little notification button because if you could only see the list of episodes that I have sitting next to me, you would be absolutely riveted to this channel for the next several years. If you want to help support, just go to thelandofchem.com, the limited edition. First print copies with the purple orchid paper are now completely sold out. However, extremely rare signed copies of this book will be released soon. We are working on a reprint with a slightly different format, but for now, digital copies of the book and Land of Chem merch are still available. So if you want to show some love, just check out the website. If you want to follow me on Instagram, my handle is at the Land of Chem. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that is it for the intro. So without further ado, let's get right to it. All right, everyone, here we go with tonight's episode. In order to explain the function and configuration of the contact process chamber, we must first review the function of the subterranean chamber and the first step in the manufacturing cycle. The subterranean chamber is filled with water from the external reservoir, raising the water level inside the structure to the point where the well shaft meets the bottom of the contact process chamber here. One thing to note, that the height of the external reservoir corresponds to the chevrons on the northern face of the structure and the initial fill level, which I have just described. Remember that from your Physics 101 and Fluid Dynamics lessons, that the height of the water inside of the container is dictated and limited by the height of the water in your external reservoir. And this is where your pump mechanism is introduced to push the water from the subterranean chamber up through the well shaft into the structure. This process is repeated until the entire contact process chamber is filled with water up to the step leading into the antechamber, which you can see right here. So the entire contact process chamber is filled with water up to this level. Then the next step in the process is to initiate the combustion process inside of the sulfur furnace that produces the sulfur dioxide. And I will be returning to this chamber in depth in an upcoming episode. But one thing to remember is that the combustion and production of sulfur dioxide requires air being introduced into the furnace chamber, which is exactly why there are air shafts leading from the outside of the structure into the sulfur furnace. However, Nothing is going to flow into these shafts unless it is being pulled into the chamber from inside, bringing us to the next step in the process, then lowering the water level inside of the contact process chamber, which will draw air from the outside of the structure in through the air shafts into the sulfur furnace, providing the oxygen necessary for the production of sulfur dioxide and then pulling that sulfur dioxide from the furnace chamber through the antechamber into the contact process chamber. And this is exactly why the antechamber is configured with a set of four grooves leading from the sulfur furnace into the antechamber to allow the flow of gases being pulled from the furnace into this antechamber. So here's a diagram of the modern contact process which shows a similar reaction and just envision the contact process chamber here being a syringe that has been fully pushed in. When you pull back on that syringe and drain the water from this chamber, it is going to pull air into the furnace chamber through the external air shafts. And that is the same function 
of the water-filled contact process chamber in the first few steps that I have just described. In our modern process, we used compressed air being forced into the furnace chamber from outside. But in the ancient chemical manufacturing process, they utilized the internal dynamics of the structure to draw air into the furnace chamber, pulling the sulfur dioxides through the antechamber. And you can see here from this bird's eye depiction that if you fill this entire contact process chamber with water up to here and then begin to drain this chamber, it will act exactly like pulling back on a syringe, drawing air into the furnace chamber through the air shafts that are not depicted on this diagram, and then pulling the sulfur dioxide through the antechamber into the contact process chamber. So before I explain the next step in the process, here are some videos so you can see the furnace chamber, the antechamber, and the contact process chamber for yourself. I hope you enjoy. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are wrapping up here inside the sulfur furnace of the Great Pyramid of Giza. And we are going to travel through the manufacturing cycle that leads from this furnace chamber through the antechamber and into the contact process chamber. So sulfur oxides were being produced inside of this chamber. And these air shafts were utilized to bring air into this chamber from the outside of the structure, facilitating the combustion process and the production of those sulfur oxides. So as the combustion proceeds, the sulfur oxides were drawn through this antechamber into the contact process chamber. And this was done by draining the water from the contact process chamber, which drew air through these air shafts into the structure. You can see inside of this chamber, as with in almost all areas of the Great Pyramid, there is pretty significant oxidation here. You see there? And you see that all throughout the Grand Gallery. So again, we're taking the same passage that those gases would have flown through. And this is a passage that was excavated around the antechamber. And you can see here, this is where those gases would have dropped down. So this is also in the antechamber here. This is looking back to where we just were. You can see those grooves on the other side of this stone partition. The gases would have flown down through here, passing through into the contact process chamber. And as I mentioned before, this whole area here is patchwork. This was originally all eroded out of the structure and has been patched with modern concrete. As with, as I showed before, the patch on the lower portion of the antechamber. And we're back here, looking down into the depths of the contact process chamber. And you will notice that the entire inside of this chamber looks like it's been heated to an extremely high temperature. An indication of the exothermic reaction that was occurring inside of this chamber the dissolution of sulfur oxides in water producing sulfurous and sulfuric acid is an extremely exothermic reaction. And in one moment, we're going to be crossing the threshold here into the antechamber, leading into the furnace chamber. All right, everyone, just a quick reminder that if you want to help support the channel, just check out the landofchem.com. I have some Land of Chem merch. There's hoodies, long sleeve shirts, t shirts with both different logos. 
the original purple print copies of the book are now completely sold out. However, some extremely rare signed copies of this limited first edition will be coming up soon. I am working on a reprint with a slightly different format, but for now, digital copies and Land of Chem merch is still available at thelandofchem.com. So if you want to show some love, just check out the website. And from the bottom of my heart, thank you all so much for the support. So now a quick review. The contact process chamber is filled with water up to here. The step leading into the antechamber. The sulfur dioxide production inside of the sulfur furnace is initiated. And then the water level inside of the contact process chamber is lowered, pulling air into the furnace and drawing the sulfur trioxide gas into the chamber, filling this entire area here. And yes, I skipped a critical step in the process that I will be coming back to later as we have now converted the sulfur dioxide into sulfur trioxide. So now we have this entire contact process chamber filled with sulfur trioxide gas and the water level has been lowered down to this step here. And yes, there are two steps inside of this chamber, which I propose were engineered to indicate the initial fill level here and the point where the water drainage process stops down here. Next, the water level is raised again, bringing the water into contact with the sulfur trioxide gas, which is highly soluble in water and will immediately dissolve to produce a very dilute solution of sulfurous acid. This is a highly exothermic process, and this is one reason why the contact process chamber has such a large volume. This entire system was configured to control the rate of the reaction by slowly filling the chamber with more and more water as the sulfur trioxide gas is being dissolved. This prevents a massive disaster inside of this chamber, as you can see depicted here. The water level inside the contact process chamber is raised gradually with an immense volume of water to prevent the solution from boiling over out of control as the gases will dissolve slowly into the increasing volume of water a systematic method for controlling the rate of this highly exothermic reaction so by the time the water level has been raised again to this initial step here your sulfur trioxide will have completely dissolved into this immense volume of water to produce a very dilute solution of sulfurous acid, which is then immediately extracted out of the structure through the quote unquote queen's chamber or extraction chamber located here. And this area also plays another significant role that I will be coming back to later. So now to answer the initial question proposed, why is the contact process chamber slanted? First, it has to precisely connect the lower subterranean chamber to the sulfur furnace chamber in a way that allows enough air to be drawn into the system. If it was horizontal, you would not get enough drainage to pull the air through and draw the sulfur dioxide gas into the contact process chamber. If it was vertical, it would not connect these two chambers within the confines of the structure. This component was brilliantly engineered and calibrated to pull the correct amount of air and thus sulfur trioxide into this chamber while providing enough volume of water during the process of dissolving the product gas preventing it from boiling over out of control. Having it slanted horizontally and with a massive volume of water is the only possible configuration. So the next question should be, how are they dealing with the massive amount of heat that is generated in this reaction process? Which brings me to another absolutely genius piece of engineering, the tiered vaulted chamber as you can see depicted here in a very simple diagram of heat distribution in a home 
with a vaulted ceiling. As you may remember from your basic physics lessons, what happens to heat in an enclosed container? The heat rises. And this is exactly why these reaction chambers, as you can see here, inside the Red Pyramid of Dashur, were configured in this manner, not only to increase the pressure of the gases being compressed into the reduced volume of the vault, but also to direct and confine the heat energy into the upper vault, which is where the chemical conversions were occurring inside of the Red Pyramid. So the heat energy from the exothermic reaction is being focused into the slanted vault of the contact process chamber. But what happens to it from there? And how is it removed from the system to prevent damage to the limestone itself? Well, that brings me to the recent Doppler radar scans of the Great Pyramid and the muon imaging product that has revealed the exact same thing. And I won't spoil the surprise quite yet, but these Doppler radar scans have shown the existence of the extraction shaft system that I have proposed is located beneath the Queen's Chamber here at 13, 14, 15, and 16, as presented in episode 60. And this is just the tip of the iceberg, as this video is simply intended to answer the question, why is the Grand Gallery slanted? Which I hope you agree, I have answered pretty thoroughly. And there is so much more to cover the operation of the sulfur furnace, the function of the antechamber, the multiple mechanisms of the extraction shaft, etc., etc. So please subscribe and stay tuned. All right, everyone, that is it for today's video. This was episode 80, Why is the Grand Gallery Slanted? I really hope you enjoyed today's video. I am so grateful to God, the almighty creator, for giving me the opportunity to do this and for everyone that's been supporting this channel. If this is the type of content you're interested in, please like, comment, subscribe, and stay tuned. If you want to show some love, just check out thelandofchem.com. If you want to follow me on Instagram, my handle is at thelandofchem. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that is it for today's video. So I will see you next time. Yo, are you still watching this? Please subscribe to The Land of Chem here on YouTube and click that little notification button. New videos coming out every single week. And check out this other episode. Come on, do it. Do it now. <laughs>